go. Just uh, okay. Um, so if I just start with introducing Kathy, um, hello everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome Kathy back um, to you click for a bit. Um, she is a lecturer in HCI at Cardiff University, which she just joined recently. And before that, she was at University of Bristol and she completed her PhD at UCLIC. Um, and so she's going to be, um, so our research is the interest are in the area of um, habits forming and how technology um, supports that. And she's, I'll leave her to introduce the talk herself. And off to you now, Kathy. Thank you. Oh, so hello everyone. My name is Kathy Stowers and I say it only to see it on the captions. Uh, right, so for the talk, I have one slide about my background, uh, just as a quickly, well, I don't have to say most of it. Uh, so basically my background is in digital health and technologies for health and well-being. And I've added a few pictures that illustrate the type of research I do. So there is lots of kind of the situated research, understanding how people do things at home and how they use technology. I run workshops. I like to punch things uh, and do research related to sports. And that random raccoon is from one of our design uh, workshops. And those are the types of activities uh, we kind of, I'll be talking about today, uh, although I'll, without the punching. So the project uh, I'm gonna talk about was focused on developing a platform for delivering therapy for depression. So specifically CBT, the cognitive behavioral therapy. And as far as th talking therapies goes, uh, CBT is pretty standard, right? You come in, you talk to your therapist, uh, the sessions are re about 15 minutes long and in the UK you around get, on the NHS at least, you get up to 12 of them. So that's not much, um, but what's, interesting and potentially unique about CBT is that it is a very goal orientated therapy. It's all about kind of actions and doing things and working towards a specific result. It focuses on your current situation and how you can make it better rather than looking at, this, at, at the past basically. Um, and this is relevant uh, because this sort of goal oriented focus uh, makes CBT kind of easy to deliver online or at least easy to adapt. So for example, uh, in CBT, you kind of progress. You start with behavioral tasks, trying to monitor what you do every day and record how those things make you feel to give you ideas of how you can change things to make yourself feel better then that leads to doing some behavioral experiments. So for example, you, your therapist and you can agree that for the next week, you're gonna wake up at nine and get up straight away just to see how this makes you feel, for example. Uh, another thing that's a big part of CBT are worksheets and sort of homework tasks. So usually a therapist can give you a worksheet that asks you to record what you've done uh, every day and then mark how this made you feel. So to help you understand which activities make you feel better and which make you feel worse, for example. Uh, there are also worksheets for kind of unpicking your automatic negative thoughts. So for example, you write down that, you know, last day at work, I had an argument with my boss, right? And then you kind of have to separate what you thought at the time and how it made you feel. Uh, and then further down the therapy, it kind of progresses towards like a deeper topic, such as like uh, con uh, underlying beliefs and things that drive your behavior. So with this in mind, uh, there's been different implementations on CBT because there is lots of potential for technology, right? So we have the traditional CBT when you just meet a therapist in person, although lately that can be done right, over the phone or online because of the pandemic. Well, the phone therapy has been available previously. Then there is the internet delivered CBT where the patient and the therapist communicate using some sort of platform that can be done through apps, uh, that can be done for services like AISO that are available uh, via the NHS. Um, and then there's also the computerized CBT, which is basically a patient and a computer. So you have a set of modules that you can log in at any time and do those things in your 
free time, which is more suited sort of for the lower end of like the, the depression severity scale, I guess. Uh, there's also a blended um, approach, which has be been becoming more uh, prominent in recent years. So blended therapy is usually a face-to-face -face therapy where the patient has um, access to, to, see, to see CBT resources. But what we try to do in this study, we try to kind of bring it all together, right? So with, with all the powers combined comes the integrated approach where we decided to take all the best bits or potentially best bits from each type of therapy. Uh, and that forms sort of our interact project, right? So it's the type of a therapy, well, it's an approach to delivering therapy that combines face-to-face -face, uh, therapy, online therapy, and also the worksheets that can be done online uh, and shared with a therapist online. So this is a multi-year uh, project, and I'll be talking about the first two stages. So those are the, the two papers uh, I shared with Tammy, which you might have seen. Uh, the third stage is the trial that is starting now. So the first patient, I think it's starting in a couple of weeks. Uh, so yeah, so I'll be, I'll be talking through kind of through the whole process because this project is a nice, almost a case study for user-centered design in the health domain, because we started with this idea and those kind of things we may work, such as, you know, face-to-face -face therapy, online therapy, worksheets online. And the idea was, let's see how they work together. So we started with this idea, we've done some research with patients, uh, co-design with them, co-design with therapists, then we build things, we did testing, and then we run an actual study with actual patients who had real depression, right? And they received actual treatment. Uh, cool. So let's go through all of this. Uh, although let me set my timer so I don't overrun. Uh, right, so the first stage was the designing and developing the platform. And apart from those assumptions we had that said how the platform should work, there were a few things we needed like, to ensure that happened, to make sure this approach can be implemented as an actual intervention uh, in the NHS, right? So to be cost effective, it would have to have fewer sessions because potentially that may require more input uh, and more work from the therapist. Uh, it had to have those between session activities uh, because homework is really important uh, in CBT and there is evidence that patients who engage with those worksheets and do the tasks at home between therapy sessions, they end up with better results. Uh, however, people don't engage with the homework. They get their sheets and then most often just lose them or ignore them. So. We know they, if they engaged, they would do better. So the system had to support that page, patient engagement. So for this first stage, what we wanted to know was to understand what are the barriers to accessing uh, CBT and accessing like, engaging with the homework. And also what are the things on the therapist side that could get in the way of making this, this project happen. So we run several uh, studies, well, four studies um, over a, well, less than a year, six months. Uh, and I will briefly talk um, about each of them. So we started with design workshops. Uh, we've done 12 of them with people who received CBT for depression in the past, but were fine uh, at the moment. Most of them, well, they were people from general public. They were recruited via NHS uh, GP practices. So mostly there were people who never done any like design workshops and were not familiar with the research. So to, so to make this work for them, uh, we run some trial workshops uh, at Bristol. So basically, I recruited people from the Bristol Interaction Group, so HCI researchers, designers, and discussed with them, like we run a workshop on designing the services to help people engage with therapy. And those are the three sketches at the top. You can see like a little dinosaur, for example, that hatches and grows as your therapy progresses, something. Uh, but then 
because we were going to work with people who may not have any experience or any confidence in sketching, we also ran a workshop with health researchers uh, from the school uh, of uh, from the medical school at Bristol. And they came up with the sketches we have at the bottom. So they are really, well, mostly those are bullet points, which was really useful because then I could get two all those two sets of sketches and show them to our participants during the workshop to kind of make them feel better about not sketching. And it worked actually quite well because the sketches here we have are the things that our participants came up with. So some of them kind of were encouraged by the dinosaur and just gone wild with, uh, with their ideas. Uh, while others just kind of made the bullet points and wrote down all the things they kind of thought would help. Um, and to be fair, analyzing the bullet points was easier than analyzing the sketches. Um, but what was the main output from those, uh, my sort of main takeaway from those workshops was that people really wanted to see the progress, but it wasn't the progress, like how much stuff you still have to do. Uh, at you, and this is the type of progress tracking you get in some of the online self-directed CBT courses. You kind of see how many models you still have to do. But people didn't want that because when you're depressed, you feel overwhelmed, this may actually discourage you. So what they wanted to see was like a, a, almost a map of where they came from, where they're going and how much they have done. Hence the road here. Uh, they also acknowledged that CBT and kind of the therapy, it's not really a linear progress, is that yeah, there are setbacks and you may go back. Uh, and that was something we, we, we took on board uh, in the design. And I will tell you uh, a bit, uh, about this a bit later. So that was, those were the workshops that focused specifically on kind of access and barriers to therapy and what stops people. But the next workshop kind of focused on trying to understand how to engage people, how to make sure like once they start the therapy, that they stay connected. So for this one, we, we used personas because, well, we didn't want people to suddenly start talking about their own experiences, uh, mostly because they had therapy for depression in the past and they were severely depressed and potentially suicidal. Uh, so that, yeah, we didn't really want to trigger them. And what was interesting here is that people found it really easy some reason to design the system for others and then immediately compare it with themselves. So the personas really worked really well for that. Um, although what we also found is that some of the participants started making assumptions based on stereotypes. Uh, and it, well, yeah, so even when we were look, listening to the recordings afterwards, some of them were upsettingly, uh, some of them were racist, basically. It's like, oh, this guy doesn't know, like he's probably from you know, Jamaica, he can't read. It, it was awful. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what you get working with people. But what we, what we got from those workshops, uh, ignoring the, the terrible comments, was the fact that people really, really needed feedback. And that was the main thing that would keep them engaged. And it wasn't it were two levels of feedback, right? So people wanted to know that whatever they do actually got saved or actually got uh, shared and whatever they did, it was acknowledged. So that was the, the automatic feedback, but they also wanted to have a real feedback for a real human being. So they wanted to be able to, if they shared something with a therapist, they wanted to know that the comments they got were, were real that someone actually made an effort to, to read it. And actually this sort of sending things to the therapist, getting feedback was something they also thought would have helped them like if they were doing this type of therapy. Because so some of them had the face-to-face -face therapy in the past, others had just CCBT. But they all saw therapy as an almost collaboration with the therapy, with the therapist. So, you know, the therapist give a suggestion, you kind of respond and discuss how it fits into your life and you kind of go back and you get feedback. And it's this back and forth that is 
really important. And because of that, uh, everyone kind of agreed that the idea of having this live session with a therapist would be useful. Although they said that one would be enough, which was surprising to us. Um, so in parallel to those workshops, we also run some interviews with therapists. Uh, we recruited 11 of them. Those were like accredited CBT therapists. Uh, and we talked to them about the current practice, uh, what they did, how they interacted with the patients, whether they had any contact with them between therapy sessions. And the answer is no. Um, we gave them our ideas. For so this diagram was basically how we envisaged how the therapy could look run based on the literature and the ideas from the workshops. So, you know, there's the first face-to-face -face therapy session, but then all therapy sessions are online. In between therapy sessions, patients can, you know, log in anytime, read some stuff, fill in the worksheets. Uh, we suggested so-called checking sessions. So rather than a full 50 minute session, therapist and the patient could meet for 20 minutes just to check how they're doing like, with the homework. Uh, so therapists had, they gave us comments on this. Uh, they weren't sure if the, for example, check-ins were a good idea because that's a, apparently a scheduling nightmare uh, and extra workload. So which is a fair point and I will get back to that later. Uh, we also asked them because we were like developing the platform at the same time, we shared with them some uh, paper prototypes. So as soon as we would design something, I would print things out and bring them to the next interview. We would show them to one or two therapists at the time, and then we would update them and show the updated version to the next person. Uh, and again, this stopped us from using features we, we thought were useful. So for example, in the right-hand corner, there is this page with, with yellow rows. So it was supposed to be a list of all the clients, because yeah, therapists uh, refer to patients as clients. And, and I sometimes mi like mix up those words, so I apologize. So anyway, so that was a list of all the patients assigned to a specific therapist. And we, were, we thought it might be useful for them to see who is engaging with the system. So for example, who hasn't logged in for a while to, to, to the platform uh, because in preparation, like before each therapy session, each uh, patient has to fill in a depression questionnaire. So there is a standardized PHQ-9 questionnaire that assesses the severity of your depression in, that, in a given moment. And there is also a question about the suicidal uh, ideation and how likely someone, like how strongly someone feels about it. So we thought it would be useful to highlight the people who scored highly on, on the severity in, in the questionnaire and even you know add little exclamation points for people who are potentially suicidal. And when we showed this to therapists, the first reaction was like, no, we don't want to see this because this isn't something they do in the current practice. They have no experience uh, at all uh, with kind of accessing what patients are doing uh, between the sessions. So, Sorry, someone's knocking to my door and I got distracted. Uh, right, so yeah, so they really didn't want to do it because that's an extra put in, uh, extra responsibility with which uh, they, they just don't they do it. They, they don't check on their patients. It's up to someone to do the homework. Uh, and, the, and frankly, no one would pay them for that. Uh, but I think more than the workload and more than the payment was the, the problem was the responsibility. The fact that they not, they are not responsible for someone and they don't want to be because that's just too much of a burden. So to address those comments, we basically deleted all the highlights because they, they didn't want to know if someone's logging in or not. It's like, it's up to them, they are adults. Uh, and then for the depression questionnaire thing, we agreed that the patient would be, out, would be able to fill that, fill that in about 24 hours before the therapy session because then there would be more time to actually do something. Uh, yeah, okay. So next slide. 
So yeah, so based on those suggestions, we have uh, developed the, the prototype platform and we run several, several seven uh, usability testing sessions where we talk aloud that they actually turned, each of them kind of turned into a little interview because at the end, all the patients would kind of sit back and compare what they've seen in the platform with their experiences of receiving therapy face-to-face -face or receiving therapy online. Uh, and yeah, and that, that read, led to, uh, yeah, so several findings. So there were lots of comments as always with usability testing about like, the design and colors we used, uh, which is always helpful. Uh, but what was interesting is that people commented on the need for personalization, not just in terms of like colors and customization and stuff, but like they wanted to know the therapy they getting is for them. So it's not just another CCBT where everyone is going through everything, regardless of whether this affects them or not. Um, and this was actually something that, that felt we would be able to provide because the therapy was supposed to be delivered by a therapist, right? It was supposed to be this collaboration. Uh, we made it specifically easy in the system for the therapist to pick specific materials and share them with the patient so that they would know exactly what needs to be done and when. Uh, and I'll give you examples soon. Uh, to test the prototype, we also run role play sessions with therapists because, you know, usability testing is a one thing, but you can't really test the actual therapy session. We thought of running therapy, like mock therapy sessions with patients but there were some ethical concerns because like, what if patients started disclosing their actual problems? We're, we're not qualified to deal with that. Um, although I had to go for the like, training in case someone uh, admits self-harm or uh, suicidal thoughts. Sorry, need a drink. <laughs> yeah, so to kind of go around this, we recruited five therapists and we had like two pairs of therapists and one pair of like therapist and the researcher kind of going for a mock therapy session. So usually one person in the pair was a therapist, the other was a patient. Uh, and kind of those sessions had three parts, right? So we kind of sat down with them, we walked them through the whole system to ask for immediate feedback. Uh, and it was really interesting to see how they were getting lost straight away. Uh, which made, like, made us simplify the system. Then they had to actually run the therapy session. So they were sitting next to each other with two different laptops uh, and they were typing because we, we agree kind of after the discussions and the previous testing, we decided that the therapy online would be via instant messaging, basically. Because yeah, why not, right? Easy to access, people can do it on the phone as well. So let's do it in typing. Uh, so the therapist typed the therapy, but they also like narrated out loud what they were writing and kind of ex explained why, uh, which was useful for us to understand why they're picking specific worksheets and how they address specific uh, topics. Uh, and then we had like a general discussion about the system. Uh, and this helped us to kind of uncover things we didn't see in the interviews because when people were talking about how they deliver therapy, they kind of talked about things they did uh, or they, they did consciously while with those sessions it's kind of it was easy to see at which point for example therapist switches to the list of worksheets and try and figure out which one would be useful or whether they already have specific worksheets they they would have expected to use and, and so things like that but what came up here was a huge concern over the workload um, and managing risk. And that was related, well, firstly, because typing is potentially slower, so you may cover less. Uh, but in the platform, we also had at this time a feature that allowed the patient to message therapist at any point. And the therapists suddenly were worried that they would be getting hundreds of messages. Like what if someone is feeling really, really bad and then they start messaging me. They didn't want to be responsible for that basically. Uh, so one way we had to change based on this feedback 
and then we kind of took those findings to other therapists we, we interviewed and they agreed with that. So we had to kind of almost prepare a list of predefined topics you had to pick when you were going to send a message. And there were huge disclaimers everywhere that's saying that the therapist will respond within the next three working days just to set the expectations to it, to everyone. Uh, that's kind of changed slightly for the actual study and to be a bit less obnoxious. Uh, yeah, so based on this, we developed the platform uh, that kind of worked similar to the way I described it previously, right? First, there was a face-to-face -face session you start with. Then we agreed to go with nine, uh, well, we agreed to go with nine online sessions. No, nine sessions in total, sorry. All, all therapists could run eight sessions in total plus three check-ins uh, if necessary. And the plan was, you know, th there was a face-to-face -face session, then there is the online session using the chart. The patients and therapists look at worksheets together during that session. Uh, then the patients ideally do the homework in between. When they finish the worksheets, they send them back to the therapist. Um, then the therapist ideally reads it before the therapy and then they discuss it and then kind of it goes like that. Uh, ideally the first, the, the requirement for, for the study was that for the first four weeks, the session's going to be weekly, but then further down it was up to therapist, um, how often they wanted to have them. Uh, they, they could be weekly, they could be fortnightly. Later on, uh, some therapists spread it over like one per month, uh, just as they would do if this was a regular face-to-face -face therapy. So I have some screenshots of the system, which I probably should have shown you earlier. Um, it is simple and it basically, we just limited it to the main information everyone needed, right? So there is a page, what the patient sees, um, what the therapist sees. Here I have a screenshot of the therapy page. So this is the top of the page where you have, you know, there is the section for the topics to discuss because before each therapy session, patients were asked to like provide up to three topics. Then there were the homework tasks, list of the worksheets they worked on. And then if you scroll down the screen, there was a section with the worksheets with the patient was able to uh, fill in. Uh, it was read only for the therapist to kind of stop therapists from filling them in for the patients because the feedback we got from the therapist was that patients should be kind of feel responsible for this and take, uh, yeah, basically engage with the worksheets themselves because that will be good for them. Uh, just fair enough, uh, which was interesting that they, they didn't like it uh, later on in the study. Right, so the, 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 the long study we ran, it was 11 months in total. And what we wanted to find out was like, does the platform actually work? Can you deliver therapy for depression? Uh, we didn't measure effectiveness for this, uh, but we did check the depression scores just to see if the trend is actually like, positive. Um, we, we also wanted to know like if there is a point to run the, the randomized control trial afterwards, because if there are no conclusive results from this study, then we couldn't really run the RCT because like if we didn't know that the design worked, it, then the trial would end up with negative results. We wouldn't know is it because the treatment didn't work or is it because the implementation was bad, right? Uh, and we also wanted to, to know what are the things uh, we need to improve. So for the purposes of the study, as I said earlier, there were nine therapy sessions in total, or eight and three check-ins. The first therapy session that was face-to-face -face was 90 minutes to make sure people build rapport, so they get to know each other. Uh, online sessions were the standard 50 minutes, although some of them overrun. Uh, as it turned out later, the check-in sessions were 20 minutes and they were supposed to be those check-ins to see how people are doing to help them with homework. Uh, 
but actually they just turned into regular therapy sessions, just shorter, although they did have a run as well. So uh, that was one thing we actually uh, had to change afterwards. So in total, we recruited 18 primary care patients with depression. Uh, out of them, 10 completed all therapy sessions and it took, I think, up to around four or five months for the, for the longest period. Uh, five participants withdrew, most of them because they were feeling better and they didn't see why they should continue with therapy, which is kind of normal. We had a couple of people drop out because the technology didn't work for them. They, they didn't think it actually like, it, it, it just wasn't their style of therapy. Uh, although there was one person who withdrew because she found the worksheets to burden some. But later it turns out that she was taking all the instructions like literally when she got a worksheet she was going to fill it in straight away so she added an extra work for herself and then just could manage it which is something the therapist could have help help deal with uh but they, they didn't uh and like three people dropped out so they just stopped being responsive so apart from delivering the treatment what we did is we interviewed each part participants uh, well, we, we, we wanted to interview each participant twice, right? Once after they had ideally two free sessions, but in reality, in most of them, they had four or five before they finally uh, were able to talk to us. So those were telephone interviews. And then once they finished, we interviewed them all in person. We had three therapists delivering uh, the therapy and you can you can see them on the slide uh, and then again after they they finished with all the therapy sessions uh, we interviewed them and then we ran the focus group with them and also the clinical supervisor just to talk about the whole process so uh right so there were, there were a few findings and i already like gave you some uh indication of what the results were uh, but basically the main thing we've learned is like the technology and the type of technology used is kind of changes the, the session dynamics and it influences that relationship between the patient uh, and the therapist. So for example, because we decided to use the instant messaging as the main mode of contact, and that was mainly informed by the fact that previous um, studies shown that chat therapy is effective and that it gives people space to think uh, and to engage more with, with the therapy, which we also found that was the case here. So some people found those, this, the fact that they had to sit down and actually form their thoughts properly before sending the message was really useful. But this also meant that there were breaks. There were gaps in the conversation when one person was typing and the other person was just waiting. And this was made worse by the fact that we didn't have a typing indicator, which is an obvious and a default feature everywhere in every chat. Um, and it just, at first it just didn't work because of some issues with the implementation. And then we were going to rewrite it. And our development team just, just kept bumping it down because there were other features that were more urgent, right? You had to have the depression questionnaire for the therapy. You had to have worksheets. You had to have um, the agenda and ability for the patient to prepare for the session. And suddenly all this, this typing indicator thing, it just kind of was falling off the radar. And then the study started and everyone realized how important it actually is. The stupid little thing um, makes a huge difference because people didn't know often, like, is the other person typing? Are they offended? What is going on? the therapist just went out to, to have a, make some tea. Uh, and so, so this, this typing, it gave people space, but it also made some people more anxious. Uh, we did fix it eventually, but it took embarrassingly long uh, to do that. What was also useful uh, and what we also found is that the, the flexibility of choices that we offered in the system 
uh, could both like help and also get in the way of the engagement. So for example, the flexibility was represented by the types of materials that were available. So patients had the worksheets, access to worksheets that were explicitly shared by the therapist. So there was a huge library of worksheets, but the patient would see like three, four, the therapist sent them. But they also had access to like a library of written materials and to some videos. And all the pictures in the slides are from, from the videos. And all those resources cover things like what is CBT, what is depression, what are the negative automatic thoughts. And so it's lots of background reading. And so people loved it. But the others just found it so overwhelming that they just never looked into the library and that they just didn't touch anything unless the therapist specifically told them. Uh, another thing related to flexibility and choice was the mode of communication, right? So chat was the default, face-to-face, uh, -face, that was the first session. But we also made it possible for the therapist to call the patient uh, in case the technology went down and that that happened a few times or we had a participant whose phone credit ran out so it was the therapist who would call them but then because of that it it complicated things because like if you had the chat then you had access to the whole transcript and many patients found the transcript as a as an actual therapy tool it was very useful but then if you switch the telephone for example uh, there was no transcript, there was no recording, although we did record the calls for the uh, assessment and just to check if the CBT is delivered in the right way because of the, the requirements of the trial. But the patients weren't able to listen to that. And also it turns out it's really awkward to come back from a phone call to a chat. No one wanted to do it. Um, so it's kind of, there was this choice, but it was, it was complicating things. And also because the face-to-face, -face, the first session was face-to-face, -face, some people expected face-to-face -face at the end. And some participants were really disappointed that, you know, there was no closure. The therapy just ended and then you say bye on chat and never speak to your therapist again. Um, with which two out of, I think our three therapists just decided that they would have this quick telephone call at the end, just to say bye to the client, to give them that closure. Um, and the final thing is that therapists had to really, really rethink and change how they deliver therapy because you know, they, they all had experience. They all had the specific worksheets they knew how to use and they were either the same or really similar worksheets available in the system, but typing is slower. And also you have to be really, really careful of how you frame things when writing because you don't have you know, the facial expressions, you don't have a body language and some patients could really easily misunderstood, misunderstand the messages. Uh, so for example, there was one patient who, who said in the interview that when at the beginning, when her therapist would finish a sentence with a full stop, she thought she was being like really, really serious. And that made her a bit anxious. Um, but then she remembered, right? We, we met, we had this first face-to-face -face session. This is a really nice person. This is how she speaks. So I think she just types this way. Uh, but yeah, so, but then the therapist had to be really careful and they, they had to start using emoticons and emoji and like, exclamation points instead of full stops at the end of the sentence. Um, one therapist started making typos and like not correcting them because that made it everything faster, but also feeling more casual for the, for the patient. So yeah, and yeah, workload, that was the biggest thing, right? So like, how do you fit the sessions, especially the, the check-ins, right? Because if, if you have a recurring therapy session, you can Put that one hour slot but suddenly there's this 20 minute thing does it stay at the same time do you try to fit more um and yes yeah, kind of managing all that was a bit, a bit tricky so i guess the main takeaway from the study uh, was that basically the platform kind of worked in the sense that all patients kind of got better so the the depression scores got lower which is like nice um, 
although it's a small sample, right? So it's difficult to discuss. Uh, from the interviews I conducted with the patients at the end, I think there was one person who clearly did not get better. And that was, fortunately, my very first interview, which we did uh, the local GP practice in the GP room. And because it was the first interview, I sat down on the GP chair, because why not? The patient sat on the patient chair. They saw my badge saying like, doctor. <clears throat> and then when they were answering my questions, they would kind of go off topic and start talking about all the things that are bad and wrong and just basically treated me like a therapist. And then I had to talk to my therapist after that to recover because they, they just pushed all the wrong buttons. So that was fun. Uh, but yeah, but apart from this one person, everyone's kind of got better or they stopped going because they got better or they dropped out, as I said. Uh, but what we've also learned is like our, every hour decision, even like really small, like the, the typing indicated fiasco, they, they kind of influenced how the therapy was delivered and how it was received and what worked and didn't. And also we've learned that there is, a, there is this fine balance between supporting patient engagement and also like therapist workload, because ideally to get the patients more engaged, there should be more contact between therapy sessions. Uh, patients should be able to get feedback more often, not just during the therapy sessions, but the therapists don't have time for this. They are already overworked and underpaid, especially in the NHS. So dealing with this balance is is real trick is yeah and then i guess different design decisions would lead to different probably side effects and different consequences so if we used video for example instead of typing it would probably have opened a completely different kind of worms um so yeah so the next step as i said if this project is the randomized control trial which is starting now it's going to be about 300 patients in total. So half of them will get usual care, half of them will get therapy uh, through, the, through, this, through this platform, and then we'll see how it goes. Uh, yes, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs> and I apologize for getting distracted halfway through because someone was really, really 